What's up everyone and welcome to the solo startup series. Now I've been working really hard for the past two weeks, really trying to make as much progress as possible. Because I've promised to keep it very real and very genuine and very authentic, I wanna show you what it's really like. It's not the picture perfect startup where I sit at my desk every day and I just work and grind and grind and grind. I have two laptops in front of me. This is my work laptop. This is an eight hour a day, five day a week job that I have to be at and I have to lead a team and I have to focus on all the UI efforts. Now this is my startup. This is my personal work life where I have to dedicate my time outside of my full-time job to make progress here. So every time I take a 15 minute break, every time I move away from my work, I grind my startup and I don't essentially get much free time. So here I have a full-time job, here I have a part-time job that I grind and I also have another full-time job at home, which is my girlfriend. <laughs> She's gonna kill me for saying that. Anyway, I've made a lot of progress and I'm really excited to share it with you guys. So let's just jump straight into it. First of all, if you are enjoying this series and you want to continue watching and learning new stuff along with me and seeing everything that I go through when I try and create this platform solo, make sure you hit that subscribe button and make sure you click that bell notification to never miss an upload of this solo startup journey to always be on top and always learn new things. Anyway, I want to address the elephant in the room. A lot of you guys left comments on my previous video that I have a security vulnerability and that because I'm sending emails back to the front end, emails that are matching with the current query string that the user has input, well, that just leaves a passageway for someone to essentially steal those emails and try and break into the account. Now, I want to make it clear that I was sending back emails to the client side just for showcase reasons and nothing more than that. Everything happens very securely on the back end. I don't send pretty much anything back apart from a status code and a boolean, which is like true or false, and that's about it. So nobody would actually know. However, some of you guys have highlighted something else and let me move on to my UI for that. Whenever a user types in an email and that email already exists, I return a message back to the user saying, hey, this email already exists. Let me show you. So test at gmail.com, this, oh, gmail. This email already exists. And I say, yep, email is already taken. Now, this serves for a very good user experience, but some of you guys also mentioned that, you know, someone could brute force this and someone could essentially keep trying different emails until they find emails that are similar and do match. And then essentially all they have to do is just find the password and crack the account. Yes, I agree with that. I agree with that. However, changing it to, for example, return just a status code or an error message that says, yeah, just invalid email is very, very confusing for the user. And if I do send an invalid email back or just a status code, they won't really know what to fix. It's, it's not very user friendly. So I decided I'm going to stick with this solution. However, the way that this becomes a vulnerability is if someone brute forces an attack. Meaning that if someone writes an algorithm to keep testing different emails and keep seeing if the status code that gets returned actually is invalid or it returns true in this case because an email matches, and then therefore, you know, they'll be able to kind of keep trying, keep trying and getting a list of a lot of emails that are registered on the platform. Now, a way to prevent that is either to rate limit the specific IP that the user is trying it from and therefore only limit a certain amount of tries and make them try again in a certain amount of time or just simply implement a recapture where they have to tick that they're not a robot, you know, just to make sure that this is not an algorithm. So. Uh, you know, that's a, a possible solution that I will definitely uh, aim to implement. I'll probably end up doing the rate limiting as I don't really like the user experience of the recapture. Um, but we'll just see. Uh, I, I guess, you know, it, there is solutions to do that. So uh, thank you for highlighting this risk. I, I do agree it is some sort of a small risk, um, but I can handle that quite easily by just rate limiting and then everything else should be fine. Now, I want to discuss another thing and it's a kind of a dilemma I was having during writing the startup. And of course, you guys know from my videos that I am absolutely a CSS fan, specifically SCSS, and I do love writing my SCSS and I feel very comfortable with it. And I'd say I'm pretty good at it. Now the question came up of maybe using Tailwind CSS, which are pre-written classes that are given uh, a styling 
to the elements in line in the uh, essentially HTML file, or in this case, because I'm using Next.js in the uh, .js file. Now, let me show you. Now, here I have a great example, uh, and this is my authentication container. And as you can see here, this is Tailwind CSS. Now, I absolutely hate the way it looks. I absolutely hate that it has to be inline and that the classes can span on for columns and columns and you have to like scroll horizontally to see them. Now, I genuinely hated this and I've tried multiple times to implement something and then I thought, nah, hell no, I'm sticking with SCSS and I just deleted everything. But suddenly when it came to responsiveness and creating a responsive layout, something clicked and I genuinely fell in love with Tailwind CSS and by no means they're, they're not paying me anything. I, I genuinely hated it and I still think Tailwind CSS, if you're watching this, you gotta fix and sort this inline endless styling. Uh, I hate it and it would be nicer if we could maybe either separate it or just make it look better without some hacky solutions uh, that I have to implement to maybe allow it to stick to this ruler line. Anyway, one thing I do want to mention is that, for example, we can reference a text size, which is an inbuilt class of Intelwind. And trust me, you don't understand this, but like you work with it for a day and suddenly you just remember all the classes and, <laughs> and what they do, which is great. You always start to do mobile first. And then uh, here you have text space, which is like 16 pixel text. And then if you wanna move on to the bigger mobile size or bigger screen size, you just prepend like a small, medium, large, um, you know, just a bit of text of a colon. And then you specify your other uh, Tailwind class for bigger text. And that's basically how you build responsiveness. Now, the other thing I liked about Tailwind is the fact that it's very consistent. So for example, Tailwind uses rems. The sizes are, are very consistent within. Uh, so there is no like, oh, here I'm gonna use pixels, here I'm going to use RAM, here I'm going to use EM, and then everything is just going to get confusing and everything is just going to be a mess. So it kind of sticks to that base kind of concept, which I really like because in the end, everything is very consistent within your application. So here is the story of me using Tailwind CSS. And now I actually want to show you a little bit of the uh, responsiveness when it, comes to, when it comes to the emails. So if I go into inspect, uh, and I can actually, I can stay on this responsiveness. And if I make the screen smaller, as you can see, it just nicely jumps around. If I join the journey, uh, oh, actually this is the login. So it nicely jumps around. Uh, in the same sense, if I do join and I type in an email that doesn't exist, and this is a valid email. Um, if I do make this smaller, everything changes nicely and it just sticks to a really nice format. Now, of course, if I do make it a really small device like iPhone 5SE, I also made it work. So uh, any device right now actually works. And of course, with, with the changes in screen size, this uh, loading bar also changes because it takes the width of the screen and whatnot, and it does some fancy calculations. You would have to refresh, but if you do load it on a new device, then it works fine. Okay. Um, what else do I want to talk about? Yes, uh, one question I want to give out to the public is that currently I'm using MongoDB, which is a NoSQL database. Now, any experts out there watching this video, please can you suggest, should I stick to NoSQL or should I move on to using a relational database? I actually don't know. I don't know what would be beneficial. Uh, I definitely know relational databases are much harder because you have to pre-plan everything and how the structure of your whole system is going to work. But if it's the case that it's going to be essential, uh, please let me know and give me some pros and cons and why I should use it or maybe why I shouldn't use a relational database and why I should stick to no SQL. So yes, please leave, leave, leave the feedback in the comments. I will really appreciate it. Now, the next thing I want to talk to you about is the validation within the platform. And by validation, I mean logging in, logging out, signing up, and so on and so forth. Now, of course, the two pages that you get access, or actually the three pages that you get access to is the homepage, so slash nothing, is the login, slash login, and is the joining, creating the account, the slash join. Now, of course, there is another part of this app, which is the slash account. But if I'm not logged in, I can show you, if I go onto slash account, it actually takes me to the login. So I've implemented and restricted the URL to, for example, load to a specific page if the JWT and the session token is not available, which you get once you do log in. Any other page than that, if it's just some mumble jumble, it will take you to my custom 404 page, which currently, well, just has nothing apart from a bit of text saying, oops, it looks like you got yourself lost. Um, now, let me show you if I do actually log in. 
with an email and a password that I know works, test at gmail.com and then testing one, two, three with a question mark. If we just see if I type that right, yes. If I do log in, it takes me to the account and it does remember the name that I have signed up as. This is all contained within the token. So it does say, welcome Philip. And of course I have the slash account here. Now my navigation changes. I have log out an account right now, but what if I try and access the login, the slash login? Well, also I restricted those domains if you are logged in and it automatically, I made it redirect you to home. Same thing with join slash join, will also take you to home. And then I can just log out, the navigation changes, and I can access login and join a journey one more time. So that kind of process is completed. Now for all of you asking, I have used Next Auth for this. I'm using Next.js, so I have used the Next Auth uh, authentication library. Uh, I'm not writing all of this myself. I can actually show you that if I do go onto this Next Auth server, uh, I'm here, I'm using the uh, Next Auth library and I'm using the credentials provider to log in with credentials. Uh, so all of that is already kind of written for me. Uh, I would never, never do it myself because that would be too much of a security risk because I essentially just don't trust myself. Now, I also made some changes to like the input. Now, previously I've had this really hacky thing. I, I, I don't know what I was thinking. Sometimes I just really doubt that I'm a good developer. Uh, that if I do click within this field, it would like know that I'm within this field. And then if I click anywhere outside, it would know to focus out. But then I was like, uh, inputs have an on focus and on blur. Why am I not using that? So I did. And then suddenly it just works so nicely. So it's a stupid, man, stupid head sometimes. So that's, that's, that's that part. What else have I changed? I'm looking here because I've got my be creative book, which I plan all my startup stuff. And I definitely don't want to miss out on uh, not telling you guys about something. I also created a public vote and I asked you guys to tell me, well, what do you guys want me to work on next? Do you want me to work on the accounts page? Do you want me to work on the payment system with Stripe? Uh, or do you want me to work, I can't remember, on something else? And obviously you guys said payment system with Stripe. So now the moment you guys have been waiting for. Let's actually go for the join the journey signing up process. And I want to show you that payment screen that I've started to implement and show you how absolutely sexy the UI is. And I want you guys' opinion on it. So let's join the journey. Okay, let's make some email. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, ship, 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 ship. Let's just, <laughs> let's just make it ship, 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 ship. Um, let's implement some password. I'm just gonna type some random keys. So I make sure I get all of those requirements. And if I go next, okay, here we have username, first name and last name. I also validated the username, uh, but it's validated a little bit differently actually. While I'm here, I'm gonna explain. If I do type in a username uh, that's already taken, so like developer Philip is already taken and I type in some name and I type in some last name. If I click next, it authenticates and then it sends back the result that this username is already taken. Um, not sure why I did it differently here. Two different ways of doing it. Tell me guys, which one you prefer. Do you want it live or do you want it to be after you press the button? Um, anyway, let's just go for like one, two, three, four, and then let's move on to the payment. Now, this is the way I want users to add payment. And of course, I want this to be optional. You don't have to fill out this part. It's 100% optional. But if you do fill out this part, it's just going to make sure that, uh, you know, the process of buying things later on is much simpler. And all you'll have to do is just, you know, agree to paying for it. And then your cards will be stored on file within Stripe. So 100% secure. Now, I haven't played around with the buttons here. I haven't played around with any text letting you know it's optional. I've just created the card. Now, the great thing about this is that if I do go ahead and type in the number, don't worry about this uh, this message. It's just Stripe telling me that I'm not using a secure connection, which you need to do when you're using Stripe. But I know 00 works, um, which is cool here. Actually, if I type in something for MasterCard, it actually shows the icon of, of that current uh, of the current card that you're using. If I type in the expiry date, and if I type in my name, oh, look at that. That is so sexy. I find that so sexy. I mean, like, uh, you know, you, then you go in to type in your name uh, and then you click tab and you type in <laughs> your CVC and suddenly everything, you know, you can just submit the payment and that card is stored on file under your name, which is, I think, absolutely fantastic. Now, you might be asking, okay, well, this is awesome. Let's just look at that animation again. Oh, shit. Okay. Um, because it's a step process, let me just quickly 
quickly fix the steps here. Um, the authentication is step three, so if I make step three first, and then I can make step zero here. And then if I do join a journey, that will be first. Okay, um, yeah, so, you know, currently I have it just on click. Um, because I haven't played around with it more. Uh, I'm going to make sure that this input field is filled out and this input field is filled out and this input field is not empty. And then I'm going to trigger this GSAP animation to expose these cards so you can enter your CVC. Uh, so I think this is really, really cool. And I wanna show you some code with Stripe, uh, especially to do with this. Let me just find the payments uh, part here. Now Stripe has this, um, Okay, this is the animation, by the way, uh, that does all the card stuff. Now, Stripe has this thing where it asks you to contain all the elements, which is I'm using the card number element, I'm using the card expiry element, and I'm using the card CVC element. And all of those elements have to be contained within the elements uh, provider offered by Stripe, where you pass in your Stripe promise. Now, this element provider doesn't have to be in this particular container. It actually could wrap your whole application at root if you're planning to implement payments everywhere else. So that's something I might do. I haven't figured out that as of yet. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, they have an awesome guide, if I can find it, which is setting up future payments, meaning you take the card and then it tells you how to create that uh, setup intent to create a new customer where you then assign the card under that customer. And then you can collect payments at any time by triggering that payment intent and so on and so forth. So it's actually very simple. This guide is it's super good to follow. Uh, I haven't, I've just read through it. I haven't tried it out. So in uh, next video, make sure you subscribe to see how this whole thing works and I'll explain everything in more detail. But basically, yeah, that's, that's what it looks like. And as you can see, there's a bunch of Tailwind CSS. Now, you're probably asking, well, you know, you've made this responsive. So how does this animation work on mobile? Well, let me show you. If I just refresh this page and I'll make it mobile and we'll use an iPhone 5 SE, which is the smallest iPhone. We don't want to move it to the side. So if I click it, it actually recognizes the screen size and it animates the card differently. So here it actually falls down. Uh, on the other one, it expands to the right. Uh, I, I guess you get a little bit of a better user experience on a laptop, on a bigger screen, but essentially uh, the same nice user experience both ways, uh, I think. So let me guys know, what do you think of this uh, payment method? Do you think it's, it's very creative? Do you think it's uh, very easy to understand Would people have problems maybe implementing and writing the numbers in, or does it seem quite clear of what they're supposed to do? Um, of course, I'm going to have warnings that this part is optional and so on, uh, so you don't have to worry about that. But I'm very, very eager to hear your feedback of the current progress. Uh, so basically, we've completed authentication, and now I'm going to be working on the payment stuff. Once the payment stuff is done, I'm going to be working on that rate limiting stuff, just to make sure the security of the application is higher and there is no vulnerabilities. And then once that is finished, um, I guess we can actually move on to creating the accounts and maybe working on streaming videos. That will be a really fun part of it as well. Um, and also, I guess once we do get to those parts, maybe we're going to have to start thinking about the whole business model and how we want to advertise it and what we want to achieve from this. And maybe maybe some UI stuff as well. So anyway, I, I'm looking forward to your guys' suggestions. There's so many things that we can do, uh, but I hope you guys enjoyed the progress video so far. If you did, make sure to subscribe, make sure you like the video below. And uh, as always, I will see you in the next one. Bye. <laughs>